All right, 2 Corinthians, and we're going to get right to it. 2 Corinthians is where we're headed. <clears throat> Second Corinthians, chapter number 6, please. Second Corinthians, chapter number 6. I'm going to look at one verse to get us started this evening. We'll pick up a little more context of this verse as we go along. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17. You got the strength to stand? It's either that or go to sleep. I want you to stand. Do a jumping jack or two. Move around. Get a little blood flowing. All right. Now you're with me for the, for the duration. He says, Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. The Lord makes a, a request of us, a challenge for us, if you will, to come out from among them, to, speaking of the world, to separate ourselves, to touch not unclean things, and then he makes a promise. If we do that, he will receive us. Being on the right side of mercy, it's not really the same message, but it does. They all connect, right? Because they all have the same author. Let's pray. Father, tonight I pray that you'd open our eyes in this area. And then, Father, as a result of the, the meeting tonight, the thoughts this, that are shared this evening, that we would become more holy, more separated, more pure, that you might be more pleased uh, with us and with with how we live, and, and that, Father, our testimony before the world might be such that they would, they would see the difference in our hearts and in our lives, and, and that uh, they would be drawn to you instead of having an excuse to, to excuse themselves and to turn away because of what they've seen in your children's lives. I pray for your help tonight. Father, there isn't a one of us here tonight that is separated enough, holy enough, righteous enough, out enough from the world. And I pray that you'd help us tonight to uh, take whatever steps are necessary and go as far as we can this evening in this area of coming out from among them. In Jesus' name, amen. So here's a, a question to open us up with tonight, just to think about. Do you, now don't answer quick. Do you hate sin? Do you hate it? Now, here's the thing. If, if you see some kind of situation that, that has happened or, or is happening, and you see something that, that is hurting someone, maybe it's you, maybe it's a loved one, maybe it's a complete stranger. It's very easy to get your emotions riled up and say, man, I just really hate that situation or that, that whoever the perpetrator is in that scenario, right? I mean, we have seen images, videos, pictures on the news of people running their car through, plowing through a crowd of people because they despised what they were there to protest or say or take a stand for. How many of you have ever seen an image of an aborted baby? You've ever seen an image of that? Man, that'll make you mad, won't it? That'll get you all stirred up. You think, by the way, when I worked in Washington, D.C., on my ride to work every morning, I'd cross the bridge into D.C. from Northern Virginia, and there were protesters there almost year-round holding signs with pictures on it of those aborted babies. And, man, that, it, it, it doesn't... It, it turns your stomach, and it makes you upset, and it gets you mad. <clears throat> you know what the truth is? If you could really see what sin was doing in your life and the lives of other people, you would hate it like God hates it. 
But the reality is, we don't often see the pictures of sin, or we, at least we don't associate them as pictures <clears throat> of sin, as illustrations of sin. <clears throat> so I ask you, do you hate sin? <clears throat> Let me ask you this question. Do you hate sin enough to stop sinning? See, because there's some of us, <clears throat> I mean, I'm talking about human beings, that we say, oh, I love the Lord, preacher, I love it. Oh, yeah, I hate sin. It's wicked. I hate it. But, but in reality, our life evidence shows we don't love the Lord. In fact, we love sin rather than the Lord by how we act. Now, I get it. Like I shared this morning in Sunday school, there's this thing of addiction. You know what addiction is, though, right? I shared this morning. Addiction is when you don't control the flesh and you don't say no to self, and it, it, it turns into that. And you could be addicted to anything, even good stuff like chocolate. <laughs> Everybody but Ray can be addicted to chocolate. He's, that's it's sinful, Right. But, but see, I'm just saying this. Do we hate sin enough to stop it? Okay? In uh, <clears throat> Proverbs 25, and we're not going to turn there. Don't turn there yet because I, I'm still just helping us here a little bit. In Proverbs 25, it talks about the sin of backbiting, a backbiting tongue. You know the cure for a backbiting tongue, right? It says an evil, you have to cut it out. That would work. But no, the, the, the biblical solution, don't go around cutting people's tongues out, all right? I know if your right hand offend you, and if you're right hand offend you, pluck it out. But if it's your tongue, go ahead and cut it out if you want to, if it's that big of a problem. But no, here's the cure for sin. Here's the cure for sin of, of backbiting. That is gossip, all right? If you don't know what that means, it's talking about somebody behind their back. How many of you, have, how many of you hate that sin? I mean, you hate it. You know why you hate it? Because it's happened to you. <laughs> but here's the problem with it. We don't hate it enough to not do it. We just hate it when it happens about me. We could ask the question, when was the last time that you talked about somebody behind their back? What? Preacher, it wasn't me. I wasn't talking. I was just listening. You're just as guilty. Because the Bible says a cure in, in this passage in Proverbs chapter 25, verse 23, is an angry look. So when somebody starts backbiting, if you start talking about him, are you getting the message yet? You better quit because I ain't liking this. Now, we get angry about a lot of stuff, but we don't generally get angry about sin. Leastwise, not enough to stop it. The Bible says, The north wind driveth away rain, so doth an angry countenance a backbiting tongue. Listen, if you hate backbiting, you'll give them an angry look when they come around starting to talk to you. Do we hate sin? Do we hate it enough to turn the TV off when sin pops up there? Do we hate it enough to give an angry look when somebody comes around to talk about somebody who's not present to defend themselves or to, to really address the problem? Almost all of us say we hate sin, but most of us aren't willing to do enough about it to change anything. Not many of us are willing to take a stand with Christ to actually stop it in our lives or in the lives of anyone around us. Um, we're supposed to be different from the world. We're supposed to, according to 2 Corinthians 6, come out from among them, be separate, saith the Lord. We're supposed to not touch the unclean thing. But the reality is, all too often, we don't come out from among them and we do touch. Right? Let's, let's get a little more context on this verse. He says in verse 14, 2 Corinthians 6, 14, it says, Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, 
For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness? Now, understand this, that verse is often used, and rightfully used, in the, in the context of marrying somebody that is not, uh, that is not a believer. You should, young people, if she's not a believer, don't leave her alone. Young ladies, if he's not a believer, don't think you're going to change him by bringing him to church with you. I have baptized more than one young man that a young lady brought along. Pastor, he needs to get saved. I'm glad that you brought him to church. I think that's wonderful, but you're baiting him with the wrong thing. They will say anything to get the gal. By the way, they'll say anything, fellas, to get you to go along with it. But, you know, that's not really what that verse was written for. It was written that we shouldn't yoke up and make connection with, in any form or format, unbelievers. We shouldn't form a business partnership with unbelievers. Uh, we shouldn't connect with them, yoke up together with them, with unbelievers. He says, because what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion with light with darkness? We don't have enough in common. Verse 15, Concord hath Christ with Belial. Can you see Jesus and, uh, and Satan playing a good basketball game together, a football game together? Come on, let's go out and play ping pong. Let's go out and play, you know, no. But sometimes our very best friends are lost people. And by the way, I'm not opposed to spending time with lost people. Jesus spent a lot of time with lost people. But he had one thing on his mind when he was doing it. And it wasn't just hanging out to have a good time. He was trying to reach them with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, my family and I will have, we'll have lost people to our house for dinner. I, we have them over. We try to you know, work with them and, and encourage them. And, you know, I don't just start beating them up with the Bible when they walk in the door, but we try to let them know we love them and care about them and want to reach them and invite them to church. But they're not my best friends. This has to do with that. Uh, <clears throat> verse 16 and what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, because there is no connection to or shouldn't be uh, a yoking up together with unbelievers, wherefore come out from among them uh, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and ye will, and, and rather be a, will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty, is the rest of that passage. Unfortunately today, Christian people are leading defeated lives, involved in all manner of sin, because we refuse to come out from among them and be separate. We have uh, made... Uh, connections with and friendships with and companionships with lost people and as a result they've become our downfall remember the children of israel they're going into the promised land god says don't marry their daughters don't give your daughters to them why did he do that why did he say that i mean maybe they'd love each other Well, I'm sure they'd be Twitter-pated over one another if they were given the opportunity, but I'm sure their daughters were quite beautiful. I'm sure th the other daughters in there had handsome fellows. I'm, I'm no doubting about that. But God says, don't do that. Because they will lead you into idol worship. They will lead you away from God. They will be a stumbling block to you. And in case you haven't read it, they did, and they were, and the nation of Israel fell. Their kings fell because they loved those strange women, and they uh, married them and married many of them. You know, God knows what he's talking about. 
So we need to take God seriously in this matter. He said, come out from among them. Be separate, saith the Lord. Lot was a great example as well for us. Because he cast his, his uh, tent, means he, he moved closer and closer into Sodom and Gomorrah. And uh, those people and their living vexed his righteous soul, the Bible says, and caused the downfall and the despair of Lot and his wife and his children. Look with me, Second Peter chapter number 2. Second Peter chapter number 2. Notice with me verse 6 tonight. 2 Peter chapter 2. Uh oh. There we go. 2 Peter 2, starting in verse 6. He says, In turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemning them with an overthrow, making them an ensample to those that after should live ungodly, and deliver just lot vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. <clears throat> and by the way, conversation is, we, today we use it as in we're having a conversation. You're talking, I'm talking, we're communicating back and forth. That's not how it's used biblically and in the Bible. It's talking about friendships. It's making connections with. Verse 8 goes on. For that righteous man, speaking of Lot, he was a righteous man dwelling among them. In seeing and hearing, vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the, un, uh, the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. You know, Lot <coughs> escaped, <laughs> sort of, but not unscathed. Notice it, it doesn't indicate that Lot participated in their ungodly behavior. But being around their ungodly behavior day after day after day after day after day, it says it vexed his righteous soul. It wore him down to the point that when God sent to get him out of there because he was fixing to destroy it, he didn't want to go. His wife didn't want to go. His girls didn't want to go. <clears throat> Maybe you've noticed this, maybe you haven't, but if you watch enough TV, you'll start talking like the people on TV. You'll start dressing like the people on TV. You'll start behaving like the people on TV. And, and you won't think it's a big deal. Well, what's the matter with the TV, preacher? Why are you picking on the TV? Because it's vexing your righteous soul. It's wearing you down, and, and that, that, that communication that's going on between you and it is wearing you out. By the way, you can't make the TV more righteous, but it can make you less righteous. You're not going to influence it, but it will greatly influence you. <clears throat> Do you hate sin? The challenge is we allow sin to rage on all around us. And I realize, can you stop the world from sinning? No, you're not going to change what Hollywood does on the TV. You're not going to change the, the, the world around you. But you can change and limit its influence on you. What did he say in 2 Corinthians 6? Come out from among them. Come out from among them. You know, people say, well, I can't control what other people do. You're right. But you can control how much time you spend with them. We need to guard ourselves about spending time with those folks. Lot chose to move to that city according to Genesis chapter 3, verses 12 and 13. And all too often, we choose the same path a lot did. We choose to surround ourselves because of a job, because of friends, 
because of circumstances, we choose to surround ourselves uh, with, a, with people and with situations that are not helping us spiritually. In fact, they're pulling us away from God, whether we realize it or not. Be careful. He says, come out from among them and be separate. Sometimes we wonder, but it just seems like God's forsaken me. Well, God doesn't forsake. He didn't forsake Israel, still hasn't. But they have often forsaken him. He didn't forsake Lot. Lot was a righteous man. It vexed his righteous soul. Think about this. And God could have, he could have justly and righteously destroyed the whole city without even taking thought of Lot. But he didn't. He went and got him by the hand and said, now come on and get out of here. He didn't abandon him, but Lot had done what 2 Corinthians 6 tells us not to do. James 1.14, we've shared this in Sunday school, but every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Lot chose to stay in the city even though they were sinful, even though they vexed him, even though it was a challenge to him. Uh, the word vex there in verse 7 of 2 Peter says uh, to wear o- or toil away at, to harass or oppress. He was around that situation, and I'm sure every day he came home for lunch, he came from home for supper just shaking and said, can you, honey, can you believe those people out there, how wicked they are? But they weren't wicked enough for him to leave. They weren't wicked enough for him to stand up and do something about it and say something about it. <clears throat> By the way, let his daughters marry some of the men of the area. In verse 8 of that passage, it uses the word vexed again. This time it has sli- a slightly different meaning. It means to torture, to cause pain, toil, or torment. We frequently make decisions, bad decisions, by the way, that torment us, that vex us, that, that, that cause us to, to be worn away and oppressed. And we put ourselves in these situations, and God says, come out from those things. Don't make excuses for staying in sin or staying in the presence of sin. And isn't that something that's very tempting to do? It is. We might be even just like Lot, a just man. It means equitable in character, holy and innocent. A godly and righteous man, it says in 2 Peter 2, chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. But it still vexed him because of the hearing, because of the seeing, of the filthy, ungodly lifestyle, and therefore he refused to leave the city of sin. Lot chose not to allow his righteous living to interfere with his friendships with the world. Be careful. When he finally did take a stand, chapter 19, verses 6 to 9, they mocked at him, and those were his sons-in-law. His family turned their back on him. His wife turned her back and and was ready to go back. James 4.4, we've again read this in Sunday school. You adulterous and adulteresses, know you not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. We've got to be careful about this thing. Second thought tonight, we need to take a stand for what's right. And I realize, and I said it already, we can't, we can't make them change. Now, we should stand and be a voice of change if we at all can be. And I've got some folks have said, well, before it gets too bad, I'll leave. Well, how bad is too bad? Okay. How much bad is too bad? Right? How dirty does the joke have to be before you turn and walk away? How filthy does the communication have to be before you give them that evil eye? All 
Often like Lot, our soul is vexed, our spirit is vexed, but we still don't separate and come out from among them. Be careful. Some would say, what, would it make any difference? Would it have made any difference to Sodom and Gomorrah? We will never know that. It would have made a difference to his wife. It would have made a difference to his children. It would have made a difference in his life. Would it have made a difference for the city of Sodom? I don't know. Truth of the matter is, God might not even have destroyed that city had Lot not gone there. I mean, what good would it do to include it if, it, if we didn't learn from it that it vexed his righteous soul? Do we know God's angry at the wicked every day? Do we understand that God is not for those things? Yes. God didn't have to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah to prove that. He destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah because it was vexing Lot's righteous soul. This is about mercy. God was being merciful to, to Lot and his family, in, and, and, and that mercy had another side that Sodom and Gomorrah saw. I don't know what differences it would have made it or not as far as the end or the outcome other than it wouldn't have vexed his righteous soul. His uh, wife and his kids wouldn't have been lost. Would the city have been spared? I really don't know. All I can say is that that city and its sin had a devastating impact on Lot's family. We need to be careful because we have another generation coming up behind us. And the truth of the matter is, this probably goes much deeper than I'm even prepared to speak about this evening, but if my kids continually hear me speaking negative, derogatory, they see me frustrated, angry. If they see me being ungodly in any way, I am influencing them and vexing their righteous soul. makes me want to be even more holy and more righteous and come out from among them even more because I know how it might affect my children. Just looking at Lot's example. Hey, parents. The future, the future. Yes, Jesus is coming. I can't wait. I'm looking forward to heaven. But between now and then, I can't tell you how long it's going to be, but these young people, that are in this room tonight have got to make it until then. And if they don't see us come out from among them and be separate like God tells us to do, what are they going to do when it's their turn? Look at the world around you. Why is it such as it is today? It's because those people's parents did not come out from among them. And what's the difference between those people's parents and us? Not a whole lot. We must, we must do what we can. And God gives us the instruction here, come out from among them, be separate, touch not the unclean thing. Um, our children sitting back, watching the television with us watching whatever we watch, reading whatever we're reading, listening to our conversations and picking up on what's going on and making decisions all the while. If we're not careful, we will be the stumbling block to our own children. In Acts chapter 5, verse 29, the disciples said we ought to obey God rather than men. I just want to encourage you with this thought tonight. There's a world full of people saying, oh, it's okay. Whatever it is. And we could, we could assign that it a number of things. But whatever the world says is okay probably isn't as okay as they want us to believe it's okay. Just like Satan told Eve it was okay to eat the fruit. 
the world tells us today, it's okay to do this. It's okay to believe this. It's okay to act this way. Here's the, here's the problem that we find ourselves in tonight. You and I were brought up by a generation of people who probably didn't know the Lord. At least not like they should have known the Lord. You and I probably were brought up by a generation who was brought up by a generation who was brought up by a generation who didn't know the Lord. They didn't come out from among them, so we didn't come out from among them. And now we have this great challenge before us. Come out from among them, be separate, saith the Lord, touch not the unclean thing, and I'll be a father unto you. But the religious generations before us said, oh, no, it'll be all right. And now it looks like, well, preacher, you're getting a little radical, aren't you? Well, that depends on your perspective, I guess. But, you know, radical is what Lot looked like when he went to his sons-in-law and said, guys, we got to get out of here. God's going to destroy this place. What's the matter with you, Lot? You've been sipping on something this afternoon, or what's going on? That's how they viewed him. And I know that in today's, you know, there's, there, oh, but it, it's a choice and it'll be okay and they have a right to be that way. Whatever that way is, all right? And there's a lot of that ways out there that we could plug in the blank. But God says, come out from among them, be ye separate. And I will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. How many of you really think that God intended for Lot to, to escape the city, lose his wife, and end up impregnating both of his daughters that, in the coming nights? Do, do we think that worked out very well? Did, did, get, did God figure that out and plan all that out? No. So when it says it vexed his righteous soul... It didn't vex it for a day or two. It vexed it for the rest of his life. And it all goes back to he cast his tent towards Sodom. God said, hey, come out of there. <laughs> and he didn't want to come out. And today the Bible says come out from them. But often we don't want to come out. One of the challenges, of course, is well, what will people think? What will they think when you come out and they fall in to a place called hell? My suspicion is they'll think like the man did <clears throat> that Jesus told about. Would somebody go tell my brothers that they needed to listen to what the prophets were saying? Can I get back, to, bring me back to life so I can shake my brothers and wake them up and no, 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 it's too late. I realize we're living in a society that is headed headlong to a place called hell. But let's not walk beside them and pretend like everything's okay because it's not. Remember what happened in the Old Testament? Uh, Moses and Aaron had, uh, had, had spoken on behalf of God, and, and some people said, Who do you think you are, Moses and Aaron? I think God can speak to anybody. Remember that story? In the end of that, they placed rods. Aaron's rod budded. In the end of that story, Moses said this, If you, if you separate from them, Come over to this side because something's about to happen. And the earth opened up and swallowed them, lock, stock, and barrel, as they say. Tents, children, camels, horses, donkeys, and everything else that they had went down into the pit and the earth closed up like they'd never been there. What if the people hadn't come apart from them? What if they hadn't come out from among them and been separate? A lot of folks would have 
lot more folks would have died. What am I saying? I'm saying this. I know it's hard. I know that the world presses around us. But we must do what we can do while we can do it. And I, I've shared this with some, some parents lately, had a conversation. I said, have conversations with your young people. You see the wickedness going on. You see the ungodliness out there. I'm not saying berate, belittle, and, 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 and cause your children to detest them because God doesn't detest them. God isn't hateful with them. God wants to reach them in love. But here's what we need to do. Have a conversation with our kids. Hey, that behavior is not right. God says so. God says we're not supposed to act that way. God says this is the right way to behave. We need to have a conversation with our young people to help them understand why it's wrong. Why is abortion not right? Why is homosexuality not right? Why is, why is telling dirty jokes not right? Why is using God's name as, as a every other word not right? Why should we not drop F-bombs every time we're having a sentence? We need to have these conversations with our young people. Because what's going to happen is they're going to grow, and they're going to be around that. And if we didn't show them, we don't, we don't talk that way. We don't act that way. That. And it's not that we're better than anybody else. Understand this. I'm a sinner just like they're a sinner. But God says, come out from among them. I know I'm not as far out from among them as I should be yet, but I am pointed out. I don't want God to have to grab me by the arm and drag me out. I need to be headed out. Because otherwise... My family's going down. We live in a sin-sick world, a sin-sick time. And there, as I've said repeatedly, if you think, parents, if you think your children, if your children have one of these devices or access to one of these, if you think they haven't seen something, or if you think they can't see something, you are sadly mistaken. Satan will figure out a way, their friends will figure out a way, the world will figure out a way to put filth of all sorts. I'm not just talking about pornographic stuff, though that is, that's, that's there too. But all the rest of it is there too. I'm just saying this. Don't go on thinking, well, it's, it's, my kids know better than that. They might, but it's still going to, it's still going to be laid in front of them. I realize, you know, there were, te there were preachers in, in years gone by that told people to take sledgehammers to their TV and throw them out the window. Well, the TV still exists, so that didn't work. It would help you to limit that significantly, but also limit this significantly. Because you don't want to lose your kids. I don't want to lose mine. That's exactly what the world and Satan's trying to do, and that's what God, why God says what he says in 2 Corinthians 6, because he doesn't want us to lose our kids. Come out from among them, be separate, saith the Lord. Touch not the unclean thing, and I will be a father unto you, and you should be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. God wants to bless us. He wants to show us mercy and grace. He wants to help us. Guess what? You have to position your side on the, uh, yourself on the right side of grace to receive grace. Otherwise, you're going to get the other side of grace, and you're not going to like it. It's not going to be well with you. It's going to vex your so, so, let's stand together this evening.
Is it going to be easy? No. And if you went through your house, if you went through and did everything you could possibly do tonight, you'd have to do it all again tomorrow. Now, I'm not saying that to discourage you. I'm just telling you that you're, we're in for a battle. This is not something that you can do once and it's done and move on. It's just not that way. Your lust will not allow it to happen that way. Satan and the world will not allow it to happen that way. We have got to on purpose decide we're going to be separate and stay separate because we're going to follow the Lord. And you're going to have to do it on purpose. And in spite of the pressures of the world and the challenges that you face. But my question is, are your children worth that? Is the next generation worth that? Let me pray with you. Father, I want to thank you for the day. Thank you for your love and mercy and grace and help. Father, thank you for this promise that you would receive us, be our fathers, be our father to all of us. And Father, I pray that you'd help us tonight. It is, it's challenging. Many of us, like Lot, are already living in Sodom. We're already in, engulfed in it. We were brought up in it. It's a part of who we are and the culture and our background and... Father, we, we, we need your help. I pray for wisdom and understanding and direction and boldness that we might, that we might be everything you want us to be for your glory and honor, that our children and our grandchildren might escape the pollutions of the world because of the steps we've taken starting tonight. We ask your blessing. We thank you for your goodness in Jesus' name. Amen. What song are we singing? 306.